Have you ever overheard a conversation where people are talking about something they know absolutely bog all about? A conversation you're desperate to cut into and put them straight. Well, going on holiday to historical sites with a history teacher is really, really difficult or really, really, or really, really funny, depending on how you look at it. Imagine it. You're having a nice stroll and a nice sunny day in Normandy. Suddenly you hear a loud voice from behind you, confidently holding forth to a whole group about a battle that raged 70 odd years ago and telling them a detailed but totally wrong account of what happened. You turn. You see your personal historian slowly turning purple and hissing under her breath. No, that's not right. It was the 29th Infantry, not the 101st Airborne, and the Canadians landed on the other beach, not the Americans. Or you're in a stately home and a tourist asks the volunteer guide about the design on a carpet. The guide doesn't know the answer, but you hear a small voice beside you explaining to the tourist and the guide the historical significance of the Latin phrase woven into that carpet. Well, in our reading from Acts today, St. Paul was in a crowd of people on the Areopagus in the middle of a meeting of people who all had something important to say. They would have been holding forth about different legal issues. You could tell they were important because they were on top of this rock where everyone could see them. All men, of course, all with their own opinions and ideas, making laws and guidelines for life in Athens. Now here's Paul. There was nothing Paul liked better than to talk about Jesus. It was his life's aim to tell people the good news of Jesus. So he'd been walking around Athens, a bit like a tourist. He'd seen all the amazingly built temples dedicated to all the different gods that the Greeks worshipped. Here are the remains of some of them. And even though they're in ruins, you can see what incredible buildings they once were. Just imagine all the fine carvings, the gold decorations, the elaborate paintings that had been in them, that Paul saw then. We see stone bleached white with the sun, but the colours, jewels and precious metals would have been unbelievable. Just imagine the cost in time, expertise and financial that had gone into decorating each and every one of those temples all dedicated to different gods, Zeus, Apollo, Hephaestus, Ares, Athena. One was shared by 12 Greek gods and many more. And in the midst of these, Paul had found a synagogue and then an unnamed altar to an unknown god. He was a devout man, so he'd been in the synagogue and talked about Jesus. He'd been in the marketplace talking about Jesus, and some of the philosophers had heard him. They thought his ideas were a bit novel and entertaining, but basically a load of rubbish. They thought he was babbling, so started trying to get some sense out of him. His ideas were a bit different, so they thought they'd have a bit more entertainment and took him with them to the top of the Areophagus to see what their fellow philosophers and Stoics would make of his ideas. Well, at first, he sat for a bit, listening to all these chaps and their conversations and arguments and debates, and then, being Paul and needing his message to be heard, he stood up and shouted out to the gathered throng, He'd listened to what they were saying. He knew they were intelligent and educated men. He understood where they were coming from and how their ideas had formed. But he also knew that they were mistaken in all their gods. Their ideas of faith and religion 
had grown up from a basic human need that is found in almost every culture on earth, to know a higher being. But they'd never known the one true God. So because of that inherent need, they had historically developed stories of higher entities who they came to believe ruled the things they saw and experienced. The sun, the changing seasons, the changes in life, birth, love and death. They believed that these gods would give them better lives if the temples they dedicated to the gods were made more elaborate and beautiful. The priests and priestesses, of course, encouraged these ideas as it meant they had a great lifestyle living in them. You know, we may think that that's an archaic and ancient idea and something that died out, but it's something that still happens today with some of the televangelists who preach a prosper prosperity message that if you send them more money, God will grant you a wonderful and prosperous life. I'm not sure how that works other than to enable the televangelists to buy themselves big houses and private jets, but I digress. Mm. The message that Paul gives to these Greek philosophers is very different. There is only one God, and that God does not live in a temple. God is not constrained by walls, and that's something that resonates particularly well at the moment when we can't go into churches and cathedrals and temples. He told them that the God they didn't know really doesn't care about images of gold or silver or stone. He is the God who gives life. He is the one who gives the hope and the promise of eternal life. Paul told these Athenians that the one true God wants only one thing, that every person reaches out to him in faith and can find him through the resurrected Jesus. As Jesus said in our Gospel reading today, because I live, you also will live. All the Athenians had to do was search for the one true God and find him through Jesus. There was no need for the elaborate temples, no need for gaudy and over-decorated buildings. They just had to follow Jesus. Well, I mean, they didn't all believe what Paul said, but some did. Paul planted the seed that God, through Jesus, had given him. So what message does Paul have for us today? Well, we only really have to look around. We can see people, possibly including ourselves, spending time and money on unnecessary decorations, not sharing what we have, creating idols of things around us. I'm not saying beautiful things are wrong, definitely not. But you know, we've seen over the last two months especially what the important things in life are. We're sharing more. We're wasting less. We're being better stewards of the portion that we have been given. We're more content with the share we have. We're less selfish. We're better stewards of the love and life that God has given us. And we can share this God-given love, love and provision with others who've not yet seen or experienced it. Beauty is all around us. And our God, our worship of God, cannot be confined within the walls of a church. To find the one true God and to help others find him too. We need only to follow his commands, to love Jesus and to ha accept him as our saviour, our father and our guide.